Be seated. Wow, what a what a stamp. Amen. God is doing something big, amen. amen. I was shared in Sunday school this morning uh, about a week ago. A week ago I was driving in the morning and uh, I think I was meeting Robert. Um, and uh, I was I was driving and as kind of my prayer routine or kind of my little, I just said, Lord, this is the day you have made. I will choose to be glad and choose to rejoice in it. And the Lord responded. He says, hey, Cameron, listen. I made this day for me. I made this day to show off. I made this day for my glory, to show how awesome I am. Listen, come on, get on board with me. Because I have made this day and I have put you here to experience this day and to take part in it. Amen. Listen, 2014 is the day that God has destined you to experience him. 2014 is the day that God has destined you. You're not here by fate. You're not here by chance. You're not here by happenstance. You're here by a divine Holy God planned destiny. 2014, with all the excitement that it brings and all the stuff you want to leave in 13 and 12 and all, you can go back as far as you want. And as much as we're looking forward to 14, God says, listen, 14 is not about you. It is about me. And I want you to experience me because I have created you to experience me. So get on board with what I'm doing in 14 because I have a plan for you. Amen. Amen. See, I want us to look at Luke chapter 24. And in Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 44, Jesus is talking to his Disciples. Now, at this point in Scripture, Jesus has been with his disciples, his closest followers. These men who sold everything they had, they gave up everything they were identified with, and they followed this man named Jesus for three and a half years. They saw him do things unexplainable. Through a period of time, their eyes were open. They were revealed to them by God himself. This is the Messiah. This is the Christ. This is Jesus, the Son of God. Then the worst thing possible in their mind happened. He was crucified on a cross, falsely accused, buried. They're confused for three days. And then the most joyous event ever happened. He rises from the dead on the third day. He reveals himself to them. He reinstates Peter. He says, do you love me? I love you. Do you love me? I love he gives him another chance. He proves himself to Thomas. He shows himself to the world. And now, 40 or so days later, Jesus says, I must leave. Now, if we put ourselves in the place of the apostles and the disciples and the followers of Christ, we are on the biggest roller coaster of our life. Amen? Amen. And now the son of God, the Messiah, who's eating and drinking and walking through walls, he has a spirit by, he is blowing their mind. He's preaching, he's teaching, he says this, I got to go. I got to go because if I don't go, the spirit of God can't come down. So I must ascend to the father so that I could send to you the spirit. Amen. So he says this in 44, he says, then Jesus said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. What he just did was he said, hey, listen, disciples, do you understand what's happening? Do you understand that all the things that you've been through, all the th events that have happened, all the miracles that have happened, all the the trials and tribulations I've gone through, these were prophesied about me years ago. These events were foretold thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, written down in the scripture by David, by the prophets. Things had to take place the way they were supposed to because it was predicted before I ever walked on the earth. Amen? Now, these guys, you would think, would have already understood this. You would think that the disciples would already put two and two together. Right? 
You would think Matthew, Mark, Luke, Peter, all these guys who have been with Jesus all this time would have put together all the events that have occurred and taken place that they could have put two and two together, but they couldn't. Listen to it again. It says, then he says to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. 45. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scripture. Let me say it again. And then he, Jesus, opened up his disciples' minds, their understanding, so that they could comprehend what the scripture already said, what had already taken place. You and I might think that the disciples just figured it out. Agreed? The truth is, they couldn't figure it out. They were having a hard time putting the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus together with the prophecies written about him in Psalms and in the, and in the book of the law in Moses' book. They were having a hard time putting two and two together until their minds were opened by the hand of God. And when their minds were opened by the hand of God, then they started to comprehend what had already happened in their life over the last three and a half years. All of a sudden, they started to piece together, oh my God, I am now starting to put Psalms 22 when David, hundreds of years before he even knew what a Roman crucifixion was, before he even knew what a cross was, before anything, we think that a cross has always been a cross, but prior to Rome, there was no such thing as a cross crucifixion. So David, who lived seven or 800 years before Rome ever existed, he's writing in Psalms 22 through the prophetic unction of the Holy Spirit. He is describing the crucifixion. So now all of a sudden the disciples are going, when Jesus says, Verily, verily, I, or, or when he's on the, the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's referencing Psalms 22 to say, hey, listen, I just fulfilled scripture that was written hundreds of years before they even knew what a cross was. Listen, all these things had to take place. So now I'm going to open up your understanding so that what you've already been through will connect with what you know about scripture so that you'll trust me about the future. Have you ever been through a tough experience where months later you figure out why you went through that? But while you're currently going through it, it is hell on earth and you don't like it and you're complaining and arguing with God, why did I get laid off? Why did this happen to me? What's the deal here, God? And then all of a sudden, three, four, six months, years later, God opens your understanding about what you've already been through to understand, to put two and two together. Hey, listen, this thing had to take place to fulfill my destiny for you. Amen? Not knowing much about sports. There's a really good preacher. The only reason he's preaching because he blew out both knees in college football. Otherwise, he was destined for the NFL. Years later, he understood God blew out his knees where he would not get drafted into that because he had a bigger purpose for him, and that was to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But in the hospital, he could not comprehend why God, who he's serving, who he's following, who he's honoring, when all the other team isn't, when he's following the Lord, why did his knees go out? Why does he get injured? Why does he get hurt? Not until later. See, at this point in Scripture, the disciples, they don't comprehend what happened. But now God says, listen, through the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to open up your minds to explain to you what you've already been through was a fulfillment of Scripture. Amen? Think about some of the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled to the letter at his death, burial, his life. Jesus is walking down the street of Jerusalem, or, or I'm not exactly sure which city he's in, but he's walking down the street, and all of a sudden, he hears a blind man named Blind Bartimaeus crying out, hey, Jesus, heal me. Hey, Jesus, heal me. And all the disciples and all of Blind Bartimaeus' friends say, shut up. He's too busy. You're bugging him. So what's he start doing? Starts crying all the louder. Hey, you shut up. I've been blind for 40 years. I want to see you get out of my way. Jesus, Jesus. And he starts causing commotion. And Jesus stops 
the scripture says, turns and heals him. And then his disciples later say, hey, Jesus, who sinned? The guy's mom or dad that he was born blind. Jesus said, none of them. He was born blind so that I would walk through this city at this appointed time on this date, at this intersection, at this precise second, God predestined my inner intervention with this guy to lay hands on him, to heal him, to bring glory to God. Amen. Everything in prophecy. Jesus could not have been born one minute early or one minute later and fulfilled all the prophecy that was predicted on him. Jesus said, hey, listen, go untie the colt in this city. Bring it to me. I'm going to ride it through Jerusalem. Listen, that colt had a birth date. That donkey had a birth date and appointed time. And God knows it to the second. Listen, he says in verse 46, then he says to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ. He's talking about himself. It's not his last name, it's his title. Thus it was written, and it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin could be preached, should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. He says, listen, it had to happen Jesus said, I didn't like it either. It hurt. That was tough. But man, isn't it good now? Now you, Peter, James, sons of thunder, you can go and preach the word of God to all nations now that that has been fulfilled. He says this in verse 49, very strategic verse. He says, behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. What is Jesus talking about? He says, I send to you the Holy Spirit. Behold, we just went through hell on earth, boys. We just went through a lot of stuff. It blew your mind. I just uh, opened up your eyes to see what we went through. Listen, that had to happen because behold this. Watch this. You can just feel the intensity of Jesus. Watch. In a few days, the Father's going to send the promise to you. In a few days, the Father's going to send the promise to you. Now, these guys, they don't comprehend it. We don't even comprehend it, even when we're looking with hindsight. Amen? He, they say, he says, behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry, listen, but wait. How excited would you be to share the good news of Jesus Christ if you've seen and lived with him for four years, three and a half years, however long, you've seen him die, you've seen him rise from the dead, you've seen him do these things. These guys were pumped, primed, ready to go, start churches, start ministries, spread the gospel, heal the sick, bring life to the dead. They were ready to be used by God. Amen? And Jesus says what? Wait. Breaks on. Stamp. Whoa, whoa. Amen? Why? Because Jesus knows if you operate, he knows if they operated in the flesh with the word only, that they would go out and not spread the message of Jesus Christ. They would not have any power. They would just be a babbling brook. They would just be talking. They would just carry the weight and the power of man. Jesus knew that these guys were handpicked by God himself to change the world, but they did not have the qualifications. They did not have what it took to do the job on their own. Amen? Amen. God handpicked you. God chose you. He pulled you out of the mud. He pulled you out of a lifestyle. He has saved you a hundred times over. Amen? Amen? Some of you 200 times over. Some of you three or 400 times. God has literally pulled you out of circumstances where you should be dead. God has literally brought you the answer at the last minute. God has literally through his mercy, I really want you to hear this. God through his mercy and his love and his grace has allowed you to so curse him, hurt him, insult him by the way you live. But he still loves you anyways. I cannot get over that. Just when I start to think I'm pretty good, God reminds me of the depth of my depravity. He reminds me, oh, Cameron, 
All of your righteous acts, they are dirty rags. But your righteousness through Jesus Christ, ooh, that brings me glory. Hey, Cameron, when you do things through the power of the Spirit of God, the righteousness of Christ starts to cover you, oh, that makes me so excited to be your father and you to be my son and for us to have this connection. Amen? Listen, he says, wait. I lost my place. Where were we? Luke. He says, wait. What would be so important that Jesus would say, wait, don't preach about me. Wait, don't go start your ministries. Wait, don't go doing anything yet. What would be so important? What? The fulfillment of scripture. Agree? What, what could be so important that Jesus would say, wait, except that there had to be the fulfillment of the predestined plan? Agreed? He says this. He says, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem. What if all the guys had gone to the city of Galilee? What if they had all gone to uh, Nazareth? What if they had all gone to Bethlehem? They would have missed the appointment with God. If the president of the United States says, hey, I'm going to have coffee with you at this such and such Starbucks on this corner at this street at this location and you go to any old Starbucks, you'll miss your divine appointment. Maybe it's not so divine, but you'll miss the appointment. It would be divine. That'd be pretty cool. I don't care what you think. That'd be pretty cool. Agree? Yes. Listen, God says to you, wait till the appointed time. Wait till I tell you, go here, Cameron. Well, that don't make sense. God, why do you want me to go to Jerusalem? Nazareth's a whole lot closer. All my family's over here, but you want me to go to Nazareth? What are you kidding? Okay, go to Nazareth. What's going to happen then? Well, I'm not going to tell you. Just go do what I said to do. Well, that doesn't make sense. I didn't ask you. Just go do what I told you to do. See, so many times we want all the answers. We want the outcome, but God wants our obedience. If they had disobeyed God, they would have missed the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, go to Jerusalem. Wait until you are clothed or endure, endued with power from on high. Wait in Jerusalem because something so miraculous is going to happen. It's going to blow your mind. It's going to clothe you. Amen? We are so identified by our clothes. Agreed? If I had on a surgeon outfit with a little hat and everything and the mask, you, if you didn't know me, you would identify me as a doctor or a surgeon and you would be in trouble. <laughs> right? If I walked in in a mechanic's outfit with grease all over and Joe Bob's garage and my name on the other side and I looked like I knew how to fix something, again, you would be in trouble, but you would identify me as a mechanic. Right? Policemen identified by their uniform, their badge. Jesus says, you'll be identified by the clothes you wear, and those clothes will be my presence, my spirit. I will clothe you, and I will so saturate you that people will look at you and go, whoa, that's attractive. That looks good on you. Wow, you look awesome. Man, where do you shop? Woo, that looks good. What, did, what looks good? The spirit of God clothing and doing on, and dude upon us baptizing us, saturating us. The Holy Spirit, us being immersed, drowned in him. Amen? Yes. Look at Acts chapter one. Listen, this year, a lot of us like to get words from the Lord for the year. God, what's my word? God, give me direction for this year. You know what the word for this year is? The Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's a compound word. How'd that blow your mind? That's a double meaning. I ain't giving you one word, Karen. I'm giving you two. You know what 2014 is about, Whitestone Church? It is about you and I learning the person, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is not an entity. It is not a force. It is not an energy field. The Spirit of God is a person with a personality. He is God. Amen? 
The Bible says you can insult him. You can hurt him. You can quench him. Cameron, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Listen, I walk in, you've done it too. I walk in and Stacy, you wouldn't believe. I got this great idea and blah, 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 blah. And she goes, oh, that's stupid. <laughs> you ever? Now, my wife would never do that. I do that to her usually. What did she just do? She quenched my... Listen, the Spirit of God comes to you. Listen, I got a plan. And the Spirit of God starts to give you this and this and this. And he starts to pour his word out to you. And all of a sudden you quench it because you go, that'll never happen. I don't have enough money to do that. Are you crazy? That ain't God. Whatever. So then the Holy Spirit withdraws and gets quiet. Amen? Listen, 14 is all about you and I connecting with God, the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit will reveal Jesus Christ in the end of times. The book of Revelation does not have an S. It's not revelations, plural. It is revelation, singular. It is all about the revealing, the exposing, the unveiling of Jesus Christ himself. There is only one person that can do that. That is the Holy Spirit. We talked before, the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the old times, they said, we know the Father, but who are you, Jesus? The religious people said, oh, we know the Father. We know God. But who are you, Jesus? Remember that? And Jesus' response is scary and startling and should rattle you and I to our core. Because sometimes you and I, like the Pharisees and Sadducees, say, oh, we know God. Oh, yeah, I love Jesus. Jesus looks at the guys who just declared that they knew Jesus, really. They, he, they just declared, we know the Father. And Jesus says, really? He goes, yeah, you know your father, Satan. But I know my Father in heaven. You don't know me, you don't know the Father. That's scary. Agreed? Jesus says, you don't know me, you don't know the Father. You reject me, you reject God. Listen, same is true in 2014. I love Jesus. But when the Holy Spirit shows up, and when the Holy Spirit does something powerful, and when the Holy Spirit does something that only God can do, we want to call it coincidence. We want to call it blasphemy. We want to reject that. Then we don't know Jesus. Because the Spirit of God would never do anything Jesus would not do. And the Spirit of God is the only one that can open up our understanding to events from our past and how they align with Scripture. If Cameron analyzes his life, his short time on this life, do you notice how I said short? Because I'm really young. No, I'm just joking. If I analyze, that was stupid, by the way. If I analyze, if I analyze my life with Cameron's perception and my ability to investigate and my ability for hindsight, then I will miss all the things that God has done in my life. But when I look at scripture and I compare scripture to my life, all of a sudden I will see how God was working where I was blinded to things that were prophesied prophetically over me from day one, from God himself. Amen. See, God has prophesied over you he has declared things. He has set divine appointments. He has so many connections for you. Down to where you live, to the car you drive, to the radio song that you heard on church today. He's speaking through every single event, and he has destined these things. He has called you to a place to meet with him. And when the Spirit of God gives you understanding, then all of a sudden we will realize, oh my God, his hand has been on me since I was born. My mama wanted to abort me, but God, through miracles, saved me. I can remember that guy that was, that was after me, and God delivered. And I can remember why that happened and how God has healed me through that trauma as a child. I can now see through God's eyes things that have already happened. And God says, listen, I have an, am not just the God of the past, but go to this such and such place. Wait on me. Wait for my vision. Wait for my spirit. Wait for my power to now give you your next marching order. See, listen, 
The Spirit of God has called us to go to Jerusalem and wait on him. The Spirit of God has says, listen, I know, I know, I know you want to start. I know you want to go do this. I know you want to do, but listen, wait. How long did they wait? Scripture doesn't really tell us, but here's an interesting point, and it is a little bit of assumption, but best guesses say there was 500 people that went to Jerusalem. 500 followers of Christ that took the order and they went to Jerusalem to wait on the Holy Spirit. But do you know what Acts chapter 1 says? And 120 were in the same place. Indicating that could be pretty good, st pretty good suggestion that 380 of them got tired of waiting and went and did their own thing. Amen? Listen, wait upon the Lord. There is an appointed time for you. This year is the year of Jesus, the open door. The word 70 in Hebrew is the word ayin, A-Y-I-N. I'm probably butchering that word, but it basically says have eyes to see this decade. The word 70, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74. That's the Hebrew year. We're in the year 2014. We're in the Hebrew year 5,774. We're in the year of seeing the decade of seeing with eyes that God sees. So this year, as God opens doors, if you are looking with heavenly vision, frontwards and backwards, and on the present, when you see the way God sees, all of a sudden, that which looks like opposition, that which looks impossible, that which looks like a curse, God says, no, that's not a curse, that's a blessing. My last story, I, 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 or my last illustration is Genesis chapter 15. You don't have to turn there. We touched on it last week. But God went to a man named Abram. And Abram was an old man. The Bible says, I think, in his 90s. And God goes to this God follower named Abram. He says, hey, Abram, I'm going to give you a baby. Hey, Abram, I'm going to give you a boy. In fact, I'm not just going to give you one. You're going to be the father of my nation. That's what you're going to do. You're going to have so many kids, you can't even count them. How are you like that, Abram? Hmm. I think Abram did this and looked down, too. He was like, I'm 90. This ain't happening. Are you kidding me? You know what I'm saying? Abram's in his tent. Genesis chapter 15. God says, hey, Abram. Let's walk through the tent door outside. Hey, Abram, let's walk through the door and change your perspective. Hey, Abram, I'm God. Why don't you look up in the sky? Count the stars, Abram. Abram starts to count. God says, listen, you got to change the way you view the word that I just spoke to you. Because I am God, and if I said it, I will do it. Amen? Amen? I'll take what's impossible for you. I'll take what's dead to you and bring life to it. And I will make you the father of many nations. And that baby will come from you, not your maidservant. It will come from your line. It will be your child. Amen? Amen. Listen, Abram had to get out of his tent and walk outside with God and look at the vastness of God's creation. As God opens up doors to us, and it sounds impossible, ask God, would you walk me outside and show me the vastness of your creation so that I could see with my eyes and have faith to believe that you will do this year what you have destined only for this year. Amen? Listen, your life is compounding. Your life is building. It's... it's, it's I don't know how to say it, but it's level upon level upon level upon level. At 14, whether you are 90 or whether you are 14 or 3, God has a plan for you this year, right now. There are predestined times, dates, events, meetings, intersections with God that he's going to blow your mind. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Let's stand up. Let's pray. I don't want to close the service this morning. If you would bow your head, uh, let me just ask you a question.